Talking Tolkien Podcast, Episode 14, Mythopoeia. All right, go ahead. Hi everyone, John Carswell here. Welcome to the Talking Tolkien Podcast, your conversational guide to Middle-earth and the works of J.R.R. Tolkien. On this episode of the podcast, we discuss Tolkien's poem Mythopoeia, which he wrote after a conversation with his friend C.S. Lewis. This poem reveals a lot about Tolkien's thoughts on creativity, and could be seen as something of a personal manifesto for him. It's not an easy read, but hopefully our discussion will help to clarify it and make it more accessible, because in my view, it's profound. Also, please leave us a rating and feedback on iTunes. We'd love to know what you think of the show. Enjoy! Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Talking Tolkien Podcast. Um, so, this is John, and I'm joined as always by Greta. Greta, how are you? I'm well, John. How are you? Doing well. Doing well. Okay. Um, I think I should just like copy that intro and just... Attach it to every episode. <laughs> it does sound. Yeah. It does well, I'm hoping you'll say something much. different than what you normally say. Oh. Like I'm, a, I'm pretty sweet, I guess, or something like that. Yeah. Oh, know? okay. Like try to be you funny know? or something. Yeah. Yeah. Or just you know mix it up a little bit. Mix it up. Mix it up a little bit. Okay. I'll uh, put my thinking cap on. See what I can come up with for next time. We could, well, we can try it again. See what you come up with this time. We oh, could try it again. All right. Yes. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Talking Tolkien Podcast. This is John. Uh, as usual, I'm joined by Greta. Greta, how are you? I am awesome! Alright. Hopefully you can come up with something better next time. Alright. I was ch- channeling my inner Jean Ralphio. Uh, <laughs> That's what I was trying to is that do. that what that was? I see. Maybe I didn't sing enough words to really make that clear. Yeah. That's probably... Yeah, you gotta sing more words, but... Uh, but, you know, work on the singing part before... <laughs> before next time. If you're, gonna, <laughs> if you're gonna pull that one again. Oh, fine. Yeah, sorry. Okay. I, I mean, you know, I wasn't even creative. I just said the same thing and then expected you to come up with something. But That's true. I think it's a double standard. It is. Mm-hmm. But shameless, John. What are you going to do? Shameless. I'm the one in power. So, you know. Hmm. It's my podcast. I do what I want. <laughs> wow. This Did I say that out loud? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> I don't think I need to point out that without me, you wouldn't have a very interesting podcast it would just be you going blah just, blah blah talking blah 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 talking it would just blah, be blah, me blah, talking, talking like this all the whole time yes you see Tolkien meant this when he said this yes I am your Tolkien translator exactly and that translates into boring boring yes so so I bring good. the life to your podcast so you I do. suggest you try to be nice to me you make it Keep awesome that's what I'm talking about. I yeah. thought I was better. Okay. Moving on. <laughs> um, thanks to everyone who has left us ratings on iTunes. Yes, thank you, And for thank the kind you. comments. Absolutely. Um, so exciting. Yeah, it's uh, it's cool to get feedback and, um, and see those stars up there. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, thanks. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Um. And uh, keep leaving comments. If you haven't le- left a comment, if you haven't left a rating yet on iTunes, please do so. Um, and yes, thank you. Um, so I got we, we got before we dive into Mythopoeia, Mythopoeia. I think that's how you say it. We're going to talk about how you say it in here in a minute because I'm not sure. But uh, I need to mention something that is um, a bit of a hiccup, a bit of a, an unfortunate little twist in the plot of this podcast. Um, There happens to already exist another Talking Tolkien podcast. And I did not know this when I started this podcast. (laughs) Um, In fact, somehow, even though this podcast existed before, even though that podcast existed before this one, um, we, we, well... 
I don't know, you can never tell with iTunes, but whenever I look for like Tolkien podcast on iTunes, this one comes up before. And I think that was why I didn't see it at first. It also looks like this other one only started maybe a month before ours did. And so it may not, I don't know what the story with, with the other one is. Um, and it's actually not called Talking Tolkien. It's called English Courses Talking Tolkien, apparently. But it's still, it's Talking Tolkien. That's the important part. So, um, you know, given that they obviously got to the name first. Yes. I think we got to change the name. Which stinks yeah. because that's a lot of work. Um, and, um, and you know, I I made that awesome song, which... Eventually, is going to get heard by the right people and be a you know. I forgot about and be a song. massive platinum, multi platinum success. I'm sure probably win some Grammys. Probably. I I heard they were thinking about putting it up for a Grammy next year. I'm not surprised one bit. Yeah, me neither. I mean, I'm just surprised it took them this I, long. I hear it's they what should all, have like made a special Grammys episode just to award that yeah, song. I hear it's what all the uh, young people are dancing to in the clubs these days. I'm sure. Yes, waving their glow sticks and waving dancing, their glow sticks, dancing, doing the talking Tolkien. Yeah. yeah. Too bad there's not a way that we can show our listeners the sweet talking Tolkien dance move that we've come up with. Have we come up with dance? I haven't come up with any dance moves on this. Again, I the can't life dance of the podcast though, so. right here. Yeah, that's so. true. Okay. Um, but you know what? We will uh, we will come up with something awesome. Well, we've been talking about some different ideas. We're not gonna we're not gonna spill the beans on those tonight. Um, you know, because we're still kind of mulling it over. Um, my own view on it, though, is that uh, I feel like I'm honing in on more of a specific concept for mm-hmm. this podcast and for the website and mm-hmm. what I'm trying, what in the world it is I'm trying to do. Yep. Which I've just been trying to kind of figure that out for the last six months uh, with this Tolkien thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes you're Frodo and you don't know from the very beginning when you start out that you got to take a ring and throw it into Mordor. You know, throw it that's into the, to Mount Doom, right? That's true. Um, but that's sometimes, true. sometimes you just start out and you're like, "I got to go somewhere. I feel this call to go to go somewhere," and you don't find out what your purpose is until much further into the journey. You know, mm-hmm. and I feel like that's been that's been us so far. I mean, we you know we wanted to unpack you know some of these things go really deep in Tolkien, but um, there's some more more things to the concept which I feel like we've kind of been able to identify and so next on the next episode we'll talk some and hopefully we'll reveal the new name at that one um and then over the next couple of episodes we'll make the we'll try to make as smooth a transition as we can so that it it looks pretty seamless to everybody else um you know maybe this will just be kind of like melkor going from melkor to morgoth which you don't know about that yet but um i think that might actually happen in the next chapter of the silmarillion Mm. but it's one of those smooth transitions um, that is noticeable, but it's some you know early on it's early on he's Melkor and then later on he's Morgoth, right? But it's you know it's the same oh, person right, the whole right, time. Right, That's right, what right. I'm saying. I so, see what you're saying. I see yeah. what you're saying. What do you think I was saying? I, I actually had no clue had no what clue. you were saying. I thought Morgoth was a place actually, and that Melkor had to go to Morgoth. To accomplish something, so I, I was like, I can "How see is why that?" You got them, why you would have gotten that mixed up? I, I didn't quite so. understand how, what that had to do with our name. So I was like, "John, we're not like taking a road trip here. We're talking about a name." That's true. So thank you for explaining that to me. Well, yes. Yeah, so I, I kind of feel like this is, um, dare I say, providential, uh, well, because it's gotta be. again, yeah, and uh, you know, and I try, I'm trying to look at it this way. It was a huge bummer when like I discovered this. It was like, um. You know, I think, I don't know what I was doing. I think maybe I was, like, um, checking, like, our number of subscribers or downloads. And I was like, all right, we're doing pretty awesome, you know. And then I, like, go on to see where we're, you know, where we're kind of ranking. On, I do all this. Sorry. You know, I, I, this is my podcast. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, but I went to iTunes to, to, like, you know, kind of see, um, you know, where we're stacking up when I search for some different things. And then I saw this and I was like, uh-uh. No, <laughs> this sucks. Oh, my gosh. Um, so, I hope the other people's podcast is a good one. I didn't. I haven't listened to it. Um, I'm sure it's. I'm sure it's great. Mm-hmm. And you know, maybe you should go check that one out too. Um, you know, no reason not to. Um, and 
I congratulate them on getting to the name first. Great minds think alike. Mm -hmm. I genuinely promise you that I did not intend for this to happen (laughs) or intend to steal somebody else's name. Um, But, yeah. Stuff happens. Dems the breaks. Dems the breaks. Just gotta make the best. It's of just it. really weird how it happens so close. Like, like they yeah. started theirs, I think, in January, and ours launched in like February. It's really weird how it all just kind of. Now, are we started. sure that they didn't actually start theirs after ours and then just go back and post date? From what I can tell, oh, I don't think that's possible. That's From what possible. I can tell on okay. iTunes, they first posted in in early January, but okay. Um, hey, if they were smart enough to figure out how to do that, more power to them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, that's, that's fine. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, you know, I think we've, I think we've hit on some stuff you and I have been discussing what the new name should be. And, you know, yeah. so we'll talk about that in a net, in a future episode. Um, and I'm excited about that anyway. So yes. I've kind of left the name behind in Good. my heart. So, okay. yeah. well, that's, that's the first step. That is the first that step. That's the first step is that unattachment. Yeah. Or disattachment. Or detachment. Detachment. That's the word I was looking for. Dis- disattachment. Disattachment. I think I think that's a word we just made up. Disattachment. Yeah, you know. Maybe we can work that into our new name somehow. Yeah. Maybe. But probably not. Probably it would get too complicated. If we probably would, and it would just be confusing. All right. All right. On to uh, mythopoeia. So, yeah. How would you say it? How would you say this word? Well, I've title? been saying it mythopoeia. Mythopoeia. Because I think that's how I've heard you say it. Yeah, and I but... hear people say it like that, and then I think, maybe it should be mythopoeia. Um, maybe I'm just overpronouncing it there. Well, poeia makes you think of poetry, yeah. right? So it's a poem about myths, right? Mm-hmm. So mythopoeia probably would be more close to what the poem's about. Yeah. Maybe. Mm-hmm. But I feel like mythopoeia is easier to well, say. Well, interesting note. You realize that the title, it almost hits for the vowel cycle. Does it? Yeah. I know there was such thing as a vowel cycle. I just made that up. Oh. But you know what I mean, right? It's almost got every vowel in it, right? So if oh, it, if it were if it were mythopoeia... Then it would be then it would hit for the vowel cycle because it's just missing a U. Oh, a vowel cycle like a baseball cycle. Yeah, you know, like oh, in baseball, you hit yeah, for the cycle, yeah, and it's yeah. like you get a home run, a triple, a double, and a single, right? So wait, what is it missing? It's missing a U. Oh, it is missing a yeah. U. So I said it could be mythopoeia. Mythopoeia. Yeah, or it could be mythopoeia. Yeah. Well, darn, that yeah. stinks. That stinks. It's yeah. like it's like the U is like the triple, right? Because right. that's the hardest thing in the baseball cycle to get. The U is sometimes the hardest vowel to work in. Yeah. So that is an interesting note, though. Yeah, it's just kind of a little, little thing. Mm-hmm. Ain't no, ain't no thing really. <laughs> just um, a little thing. Yeah. But so, a chicken wing. So did you do? Uh, did you do a haiku? Funny that you should ask, because right after we started talking on this episode, I realized, shoot, I didn't do my haiku. Sorry, I did two of them. So, I have been sitting here trying to think of one in my head, and I think I've got two out of three lines down, but then I didn't have anything to write it down with, and so I'm looking around, trying to pretend that I'm interested in what you're talking about, while trying to compose my haiku and find a writing instrument in our room somewhere and then I see that one beside you but I'm afraid to reach across you to get it so can I have it real quick and you can read me yours while I jot mine down well no because you're not going to be paying attention if you're jotting yours down well why don't you just I don't think you should be able to compose a haiku in the middle of the podcast you missed you missed the (sighs) boat dang it I just forgot fine I'm listening (laughs) fine I'm listening while I write all right attention to haiku Haiku. All right. Let's do it. Stop writing. Have you done our um, theme song for our haiku segment yet? No. I got to write a whole new thing. Haikus. Awesome sauce. Haikus. Rule of world. Okay. Go on. That was horrible. (laughs) (laughs) That will not be the haiku (laughs) theme song. I was trying to channel my inner Garth. Wayne's world. Do me a favor and never do that again. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm trying. All right. Um, all right. First haiku. Mm-hmm. Tolkien to Lewis. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
That was bad. I'm just thinking of your what? theme song again. That was that was distractingly bad. That was like so bad. You know, it's something I'm gonna think of. Well, now I when I'm trying to be serious. In so the I've future. actually accomplished my purpose then, because I've now bought myself an extra few seconds. Because you still haven't started reading your IQ because right. you're so busy thinking about how bad that. Tolkien to Lewis, take heart. All is not in vain, unless you will it. Hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Take heart. All is not in vain unless you will it. I like that. Yeah. Yep, I really like that. Yeah, I like that. Nice nice response while you're still writing your haiku. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, the second one I have is, well, let's hear what you have. Finish it. Finish it. Last line. <laughs> well, I have two Under of my pressure. three lines. Well, okay, see if I can do it on the fly. Maybe you can read one and then people can people can offer how they'd finish it. Okay. You can we this this could be finished my I just my finished it. I oh. just finished it. I'm awesome. This is either going to be really really good or really bad. Okay. My vote is on really bad. So prove me wrong. Dang. No, I can't pro- do anything right. Well, no, tonight. You, you did it on the fly. I'm just. It would be really bad if anybody did it on the fly. So let's see what you got. Okay. <clears throat> Wanting to create makes us truly what we are. Glorified one day. Mm. Wanting to create makes us truly what we are. Glor. What is it? Glorified one day. Oh, pretty good. Pretty mm-hmm. good. Wow. Nice. Thanks. Maybe I'll just write all of our all of my haikus <laughs> in the mini, in the beginning of our podcast from now on. Uh, no, 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 I'm no. Just kidding. No, I would you, never do such a thing. Thou, thou shalt not. Thou shalt not. I liked yours though. Alright. So I think mine was better. Well, I've got another one. Alright. Well guess what? So do I. Arts. So go for it. No, you don't. My brain. Art's no hobby, nor music construct of noise. No. Man makes destiny. Man makes destiny. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. I like the part about music. Mm-hmm. How it's not noise. Although I feel like some music does sound like noise. If I'm being honest. But I understand what you're saying. Mm-hmm. And I dig it. Yeah, I like it. Good. I like it a lot. All right, let's hear the one that's floating around in your head. All right. Lewis, listen now. I have a tale to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Creativity. <laughs> So wait, wait the like, tale he has to tell him is creativity. <laughs> yes. Creativity is the theme of the tale, right? That's <laughs> that's pretty funny. <laughs> that's uh, Well, I like it when I can make you laugh so hard you cry, because it doesn't happen that often. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> You're speechless. Well, I'm trying to think, like, that's pretty, um... (laughs) (laughs) Words. Words fail you. (laughs) This is a new high for me. I'm just trying to picture, I'm just trying to picture Tolkien talking to Lewis and (laughs) and being like, I have something to tell you. (laughs) And he, like, pauses and Lewis is like, tell me. Tolkien's like... Creativity. It's like, it's like, it's like, he could have just said tacos. <laughs> you know? Or, except tacos only has two syllables, not five. Right. And he could have said tacos, guacamole. <laughs> guacamole. Well, that's four syllables. Guacamole, yeah, yeah that is four. Pepperoni pizza. <laughs> 
<laughs> I like rum and coke. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Well, I'll do better next time. Actually, I really like that. <laughs> something about that feels far more haikuish than something I wrote. <laughs> I can see why. Yeah. I can see why. Maybe it's the minimalist approach. So. With the simplicity of you it. You have totally and utterly redeemed yourself with that last with that last haiku on the fly there. Awesome. Well, thank you. So, good. I will allow you to continue with this episode based on that. <laughs> Phew! I survived my Hunger Game. Your Hunger Game? My Hunger Game matchup. Yeah, my oh. Hunger Game duel. Anyway. Yes. You will not kill me. That's what I'm trying to say. Well, that, that wasn't what... I, I wasn't planning on killing you before. Well, essentially, if you if I was fighting for my place on the podcast, essentially that would have been seen to me as like, oh, like I would voted have, off the island or something. Kill, like yeah, that. exactly. Voted off like podcast island. Yeah, like you would have kind of killed a piece of me. A piece of my heart would have been missing. I only have one thing to say to you. What? Creativity. Creativity. <laughs> <laughs> Creativity. Um, yes. Yeah. All right. Um. So, mytho, mythopoeia, mythopoeia. Maybe I'll just say mythopoeia. It is easy. If somebody out there knows how to say this the right way, tell me. I'm going to say mythopoeia because our podcasts are already really long, and this will shorten it by (laughs) maybe like a couple of seconds if we say mythopoeia instead of mythopoeia. We're already like half an hour into this, and we haven't even started the poem, aren't we? Man, okay. Well, I want to set the stage real quick, and then we'll talk about the poem. Um, Better make it real quick because we got creativity to talk about stop putting i don't work as well under pressure as you do so you know stop it okay all right um so i have this copy of tree and leaf which uh contains on fairy stories and mythopoeia mythopoeia and um leaf by nagel and the homecoming of bearknath um so in the preface to it, or whatever you call it, the preface, yeah, the preface, uh, Christopher Tolkien uh, talks about what where Mythopoeia came from. Uh, and basically, it's a poem that went through seven different drafts over the course of several years. Hmm. And it's all based on um, a conversation that Tolkien had with C.S. Lewis, his good buddy C.S. Lewis. Um, so when it talks about uh, Philomathus to Mizomathus, mm-hmm. Tolkien is Philomathus and Lewis is Mizomathus. And they right? both have the word myth in them. Right. Because it's all about... Um, uh, the C.S. Lewis, early, um, early in their friendship, had been talking to Tolkien and had said, myth and fairy story are lies, Right. Even though C.S. Lewis was a big fan of myth, he viewed them as lies. Okay? Right. Right. Um, and so Tolkien take, took deep issue with that. Right? He was like, no, they're not lies. And let me explain myself. Okay? So that's what this poem is all about. Uh, I wanted to... So he says a little bit about the scene um, that was kind of the, 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 the setting for this original conversation. And this comes from some of uh, Lewis's own letters. But just kind of picture this in your head. Okay. So on the night of 19 September 1931, C.S. Lewis invited Tolkien and Hugo Dyson to dinner in Magdalen College. All right. Um, and afterwards, they walked in the grounds and talked as C- as Lewis wrote three days later to his friend Arthur Greaves of metaphor and myth, interrupted by a rush of wind which came so suddenly on the still warm evening and sent so many leaves pattering down. We thought that we thought it was raining. We all held our breath, the other two appreciating the ecstasy as such a thing almost as you would. All right? Um, so kind of picture that scene first in your mind. Like, have you ever been outside on a night when, like, a front passes through? And it's like, oh, you know, yeah. things may be really yeah. calm. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, it's like things get really crazy. And you're like, whoa, how did that happen? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, like, picture that. And is like, the setting for this conversation. Um, and it's a really... It's kind of a fat, you know, a fascinating way to picture to picture this conversation taking place, right? Uh-huh. With this poem, uh, and then in a subsequent letter, 
um, Lewis recounted the ideas proposed by Dyson and Tolkien in respect of the true myth of the story of Christ. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, elsewhere we've talked about that notion that for Tolkien, the true myth is the story of Christ. But the story of Christ being the ultimate myth, it also informs, in Tolkien's view, it informs all other myth. So even though, like, we may not say necessarily that, like, the myths of ancient Greece are, like, true in the way that the story of Christ is true, mm -hmm. um, Tolkien does not draw this hard line and be like, it's not true. Like, they're all lies, you know? Yeah. Um, for Tolkien, it's, there's, much, there's this much more mystical thing going on, and it's almost like um, our, our minds are channeling something that is coming from this this outside of us, this mysterious place, and, and we're doing our own work on it to transform it and give it expression, right? But these are truths that are true, right? Right. Yeah. We don't necessarily when we when we create myths and that kind of thing, we don't necessarily like make this thing that's a hundred percent true in the sense that the story of Christ is true. But nevertheless we um we we take these ideas that are true, right? Mm -hmm. um, these things that exist in ways we can't completely comprehend them and transform them into things that we can comprehend, right? Right? We yes. can more clearly comprehend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Um, so so that's kind of the the background to this. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. No, go ahead. I was just gonna ask a question. You may have answered this, and I missed it already, but. Um, so Lewis, at one point before he. Um, uh, b before he became a Christian, before he he uh, professed belief in Christ, he was an atheist. Is that correct? That's right. I, I'm not sure if he was an atheist when they had this conversation. Oh, that's, that was my question. We'll get we'll get to that because we're going to get to oh, that in okay. the poem. Okay. Um. Yeah. But. So this poem is basically Tolkien's attempt to convince Lewis that myths are not lies; that they that they have a very real. An important purpose. Yes. In life. Right. And in our humanity. Right. Yeah. So so we set the stage. I think to your point, we've you know let's let's maybe pause, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about the story. Okay. All right. Or the the story. We'll talk the about the poem. poem. Yep. The poem itself. All right. So, um, yeah, we'll be right back. Yep. Yep. Do you know the tale that Tolkien called the kernel of the Middle Earth mythology? Baron and Luthien is the story of an outlaw mortal and an elvish princess tasked with obtaining a Silmaril, one of the holy jewels of the Blessed Realm, from the Iron Crown of the Dark Lord Morgoth. In my new book, Tolkien's Requiem, I explore the legend of these doomed lovers. In doing so, I aim to provide a back door into the world of the Silmarillion for those who have struggled to give it a go. One of Tolkien's greatest achievements, the story of Baron and Luthien, deserves to be as well known as The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Get your copy of Tolkien's Requiem today by visiting truemyths.org slash baron. That's truemyths.org slash b-e-r-e-n. Happy reading! Okay, we're back. Um, so we left off, we had just set the stage, talked a little bit about the scene in which this conversation between Tolkien and Lewis took place. And um, now let's talk about the poem itself. Yeah, so, let's do it. Greta, you found this poem difficult. I did. Yeah, you're not alone. It's a difficult poem. It ain't easy. Yeah. Um, I think it's very worthwhile, mm -hmm. but it's still challenging. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And because it's kind of a philosophy poem, you know, it's not like just this poem yes. that's like, you know, a love poem or something like that. But it's right. it's a philosophy poem, and. Um, and Tolkien had a pretty large vocabulary, so there's even there's a lot of words in here that I you know I have to look up. Yeah. Um, even after I've looked them up before, like I don't know what the heck limning is. Um, oh yeah, I looked that one up too. Yeah, well, I didn't look that up this time. What is that? You know, I didn't quite understand the definition. To be quite honest, it has to do with painting mm -hmm. and like basically expression through like it had like various hues it's basically it was painting a picture with various hues i think hey, as a means of expression by the way i um on my on on true myths 
dot org. I actually have uh, done a breakdown of Mythopoeia um, into three parts, I think, and four. into four parts. Four parts. Oh, okay. Did you use it? Yes. Oh, okay. Completely. Cool. Was it helpful? Very helpful. Oh, cool. Yes. Well, there you go. So it's helpful. You know, I write those things so that I can go back and reference them myself because sometimes, <laughs> you know, sometimes I lose track of all this stuff. Um, even though I, I spend a lot of time thinking about it, sometimes I lose track of, of certain things. Um, did I define limiting is there in there? I don't remember. I don't think you did. Yeah, okay. Well, I just looked it up on um, yeah. dictionary.com. Well, this is not about necessarily what limiting is. So No, but it, it's basically, it's an artistic term though. Yeah. And it has okay. to do with hues and painting. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. All right, so to one who said that myths were lies and therefore worthless, even though breathed through silver. So, what do you do with that? What does that mean to you? Um. Well, it obviously. I mean, I think it's just a very brief way of of doing what you just did, right? Of setting yeah. the stage, of you know, sharing uh, Tolkien sharing his inspiration for the poem. Right. Um. And it's, uh, you know, I, I think it, it helps you just kind of get into Tolkien's head a little bit. gives you an idea of where he's coming from. And, um, you know, it helps you kind of, it provides you with the lens, I guess, mm-hmm. with which to read to read the poem. What do you think it means that a lot myths are lies breathed through silver? I think it's basically because it's, well, lies, when you think of lies... You know, I feel like lies is a very harsh term, mm-hmm. and I think um, it uh, it has a very, a very very negative connotation. And so, I think when you call something a lie, that's obviously meant to be you know a, a real insult. But then yeah. I think saying that lies breathe through silver, it's still like it kind of softens the blow a little bit. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like it's just doesn't have quite the same. You know, like, they're still lies, right? But they're pretty lies. Yeah. You know, they're lies that you don't necessarily mind hearing or that you wouldn't mm-hmm. really get mad at somebody for telling you. Sweet nothings. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sweetened, you know, lies that, you know, that people, that you just wouldn't, that wouldn't bother you as mm-hmm. much as, you know, an outright darn lie. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's interesting. Because I feel like that's, I feel like that can be a very, um... I don't think most people would view art that way, like not consciously. I don't think that's how they define it. But I think I think there's this part of us that that tends to view if we really are pressed about it, we tend we tend to not really understand what the value of art is per se. You know, yeah, no, art that's and true. music and literature and all of the things mm-hmm. that we do um, for expression. I think it's easy to slip into this mode. Even even artists themselves might just say, well, I just felt like doing that, you know? like, mm-hmm. And and it's always part of it. Yeah. But um, I think Tolkien is trying to go beyond that and say, why do we do these things, yeah. right? Yeah. Why do we as human beings create? Right. Um, is it just because we feel like it? Just because that's one particular manifestation of our, of ourselves as animals uh-huh. or is there something else going on? Is there some other factor in play? Right. Um, and, um, but I, yeah, you're right. I had never, I had not thought too much about the whole lies part of it, but it does. Lewis almost sounds like he's like, he feels betrayed that they're not true. You know, it's like, uh-huh. he sounds mad that they're not true. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and Lewis was a lover of myth. Like he really did. He loved myths from the time he was a little kid. Mm-hmm. And um, so I almost hear, like, now that I I've, I heard you say that, I hear kind of this agony in Lewis saying that they're all myths or they're mm-hmm. all lies, you know, mm-hmm. even though they're lies, even though I love them because they're beautiful, mm-hmm. they're still just lies. It's kind right. of like, you know, it's kind of like somebody who may, you know, maybe like falls for somebody who is really beautiful, but then they realize there's no substance there. Mm-hmm. And then they're like, but I still mm-hmm. love them because they're so beautiful, right. you know. Right. There's this kind of like twist, you know, where it's like, I hate them, but I love them. You know, I hate them. I lo- I hate them because I love them. Right. right. And I mean, yeah. I know they're no good for me. You right. Know? Right. Um, yeah. And I think Tolkien is trying to say, no, they are good for you. 
Right. You know? Yeah. He's trying to say this is, you know, and so so anyway, that's that's the start. That's the preface here. Um, Philomathus to Mizomathus. Mm-hmm. All right. You know what those two names mean? Well, I think um, Mizomathus, uh, I saw it translated somewhere as myth hater. Mm-hmm. Is that? That yeah, it's myth lover to myth hater. Myth right? hater. Okay, yeah, yeah. philia meaning love. Yes. Right. And then, yeah. Um, so obviously Tolkien is the lover of myth too. And maybe lover and hater are not the best terms, but like maybe one is like one one has the high view of myth and one has a low view of myth, right? Okay. Uh, because yeah. as I said, Lewis loves myth. Sure. Yeah. All right, so Tolkien to Lewis. Um, you look at trees and label them just so, for trees are trees and growing is to grow. You walk the earth and tread with solemn pace one of the many minor globes of space. A star is a star, some matter in a ball, compelled to courses mathematical amid the regimented cold inane, where destined atoms are each moment slain. Um, What do you think? What do you think he's saying there? Um, He's basically, it's a very um, scientific Mm -hmm. view, right, of the world. Um, and I think he's basically saying to Lewis, you know, this is how you see things, mm-hmm. right? Just, he's, he's looking at them, which is a very practical lens, right? Mm-hmm. Saying that the, our world is nothing more, you know, than these, you know, these very tangible things. You know, a star is, right. you know, just a, a matter. It's just mm-hmm. a matter, you know, and it's you know, controlled by math and, you know, it's just kind of like, it's like a big bang. Yeah. It's right? like just it's the facts, right. just the facts, man. You yeah. know, um, uh, I don't want any term. I don't want any of your spin. I don't want any interpretation on this. Uh, a star is a star, some matter in a ball, right? right? Think about that. Like, you know, as beautiful as the stars are when you look up at them and even when you look closer and you're just saying some, ma- a star is some matter in a ball, right? Yeah. Compelled to course is mathematical, right? Yeah. There is no, there is no reason behind the reason, behind the logic. Right. You know. Right. Um, what you know? What do you know? What the word inane means? Empty, right? Yeah, almost like ridiculous, mm. like silly. Mm-hmm. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, and here, you know, it's capitalized, mm-hmm. which which makes it like that it's without reason. You know, mm. um, that it it's. That's just the way it is, hmm. you know. Yeah, no good do, do, purpose. Do, 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 do. That's just the way it is. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, so this is this is Tolkien saying this is how to Lewis. This is how you see the world, right? All right. Yep. Um, it's it's uh, it sounds very lonely. Mm-hmm. You know, it sounds very lonely to look at the very world that way. Inspired. Yes. Too. Yeah. Um, all right, so, and I'm going to call these, you know, I think you see I do this, I call these verse paragraphs, um, the, the different sections. Yes, yeah. Okay, I, I mentioned that in my yeah. little write-up of it. Yeah. Um, so, the next verse paragraph, he says, At bidding of a will to which we bend and must, but only dimly apprehend, great processes march on as time unrolls from dark beginnings to uncertain goals. And as on page or written without clue, with script and limbing packed of various hue, an endless multitude of forms appear, some grim, some frail, some beautiful, some queer, each alien, except as kin from one remote origo, gnat, man, stone, and sun. God made the petrous rocks, the arboreal trees, tellurian earth, and stellar stars, and these homuncular men who walk upon the ground with nerves that tingle touched by light and sound. The movements of the sea, the wind and bows, uh, or the wind and boughs, green grass, the large, slow oddity of cows, thunder and lightning, birds that wheel and cry, slime crawling up from mud to live and die. These each are duly registered in print, the brain's contortions with a separate dent. Um, so, a lot going on there. What do you think? Mm-hmm. What do you think Tolkien is saying there? I think he's saying this is how I see the world. Right, like this is how you see it, Lewis, and now this is yeah. This is weird. This one feels kind of ambiguous to me. I, I think, I think he's still talking about how Lewis sees things. Oh, really? Yeah, because he still doesn't sound very inspired by any of this, right? 
he still seems to be, it's like he's carrying on with the same thought. And, well, why do you think it is Lewis? Or why do you think it's um, Tolkien? Well, I think the, um, the, just on that first line, that bidding of a will to which mm-hmm. we bend, right? Will is capitalized. So I took that to mean some kind of divine power, right? Like there's something, something made all this, right? Something's yeah. in control. Something is up there pulling the strings, mm-hmm. right? Um, and, um, and, you know, then he goes on to talk about how God made, you know, the rocks and the trees and the earth and the stellar stars. Um, he talks about the sea and the wind and the grass. and the, You know, I mean, he just seems to really... Um, to ju- to just really kind of fill in the gaps, right, mm-hmm. with um just the beauty of creation and all the different aspects of it. Um, I mean, he even mentions the large, slow oddity of cows, which yeah. I thought was really funny. <laughs> like, yeah, that's it exactly is. how image. cows are. Yeah, they are. They are large and slow and odd. Like that's mm-hmm. exactly what they are. Um. But so that's why I thought. That's why I thought it was Tolkien. You see, it just seems so much more inspired than the first paragraph. Um, but I can also see what you're saying because there are some lines in there that makes me think otherwise. Well, and the reason I think it's, I think it's, he's still talking about Lewis's view. I'm not sure when Lewis, Lewis didn't go immediately from atheism to Christianity, right? Mm-hmm. He kind of, he kind of had this stopping point where he became. Uh, he was just simp- he just simply believed in God, mm-hmm. and he didn't know like who God was or anything like that. He just believed in basically a first, um, uh, you know, the the being of beings, right? Um, Some kind of divine, right. Master, right? Overall, yeah. Um, and um, and when you think about it, like. Um, do you know what the like? Do you know what the difference between um, deism and theism is? Uh, well, deism. Do you remember this from like I'm high to school? Think. Deism and theism. No, I'll make myself sound stupid. So you just tell me. <laughs> well, okay. So, so in some like just really quick to summarize, both believe in God, right? <clears throat> um. A deist says that there is a God, but we can't know anything about him. Right. And he's he kind of just set things in motion and let it go, right? right. Okay. Um, That's actually, a very Descartes thing. Yeah, and a lot of like the founding fathers, too, of the United States were like deists, right? Okay. They, okay. they had this view of God that like, because for a long time, most like, you know, it was extremely rare to find someone who did not believe in God for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um up until, you know, very recently in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not trying to get into that. Um, a deist, though, says um, there is a God, I'm sure of it, but he's not involved, and we can't know anything about him, right? A okay. theist is somebody who says there is a God, and he is involved, and we can know something about him. Okay. So Christians would be theists, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Muslims would be theists, I think. Um, Jews would be theists, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Basically, any any religion that reveals that that believes that God has revealed Himself, okay, in some way, would okay. be a theist, Got right? It. Yep. Um, so I think that Lewis was still a uh, kind of a deist at this time, right? Okay. He believed in a God, but he didn't think we could really know anything about Him, okay? Right? Yep. Except maybe what we can just tell from nature, okay? Right. Okay. Um, and. Uh, and so there's when you think about it, there's still there's still not a sense of this like personal God here. That's right? true. There, but there's a, definitely a form of, of a God. Right. Oh yeah, he says God made the Petrus right, rocks. Right. Exactly. But it yeah. still seems very disconnected and not and like it's still like if I'm looking for some reason why all of this stuff in the world happens and why mm-hmm. I feel beauty when I look at things and why I'm bummed out when something bad happens mm-hmm. and um, and why I feel like horrible when I see that some of the tragedies that happen to people Mm -hmm. like you know I I still don't really understand and I don't feel like anybody wants to give me an explanation of all this stuff you know yeah Yeah. Um, and that's part like as human beings we want to know Mm -hmm. we want to know the reasons behind things yeah absolutely Um, you know it kills us to not be able to know like why things happen especially Mm -hmm. when they really affect us deeply you know yeah Um, and so um I still think he's talking about Lewis's point of view here, even though he's talking about God. 
All right. Okay. So, so that's verse paragraph two. Um, any other thoughts on it? Um, no. Okay. Now, verse paragraph three. This, I think, is where is where Tolkien starts to assert himself in his view. All right. Um, Yet trees are not trees until so named and seen, and never were so named, till those had been whose speech, speeches in voluted breath unfurled, faint echo and dim picture of the world, but neither record nor a photograph, being divination, judgment, and a laugh, response of those that felt a stir within by deep monition, movements that were kin to life and death of trees, of beasts, of stars, free captives undermining shadowy bars, Digging the foreknown from experience and panning the vein of spirit out of sense. Great powers they slowly brought out of themselves, and looking backward they beheld the elves that wrought on cunning forges in the mind, and light and dark on secret looms entwined. Um, so, what do you take away from that verse paragraph? Um, the... Uh... I think, um... I mean, trees are not trees until so named and seen. Yeah, so basically what he's, what Tolkien is saying there at some point is like, yeah, we, you say that trees are just trees, right? But they weren't always trees. Something had to name them, right? Right. Someone had to name them. Yeah. Um... Yeah, that's interesting. Like, what's, what's the first thing that, um, that God tells Adam to do when he, after he creates him? Is to name things. Yeah. Yeah. To give names to things. Yeah. Right? You know? Yeah. What is that function of, what is that naming thing that we do, right? Um, but it's kind of like that that first ability to make art, right? Mm. To look at something, mm-hmm. to be inspired by something and say, that's that's what this is, right? Yeah. To put yeah. together sounds, right? Yes. You know, it's only one, it, that's like the first stepping stone to like music, right? Or some other expression of art, Right is to say, you know, what do I see when I see that, right? Yeah. When I see this thing that's with four legs moving around in front of me, making this funny noise, what is that as opposed to this other thing with four legs moving around right. that makes a funny noise, you know? Right, yeah. I'm giving these two different names. Why do I give them two different names? Right, right. Yeah. Um, so... Trees are not trees until so named and seen. All right. Um, so we, we, we take it for granted that the thing we look at and we call a tree is a tree. Well, no duh, it's a tree. Right. But somebody had to give it a name. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't be calling it a tree. Right. All right. Um, uh, now, I think the, the really important line here is this... Um, uh, response of those that felt a stir within by deep monition, movements that were kin to life and death of trees, of beasts, of stars. This deep monition is like, it's like an, it's like an inspiration, um, something that comes to us from outside, right? Right. So I get this sense that what Tolkien is saying here is that when we are inspired to create, right? Let, let's just, let's just call naming the, like the most proto creativity, right? It's like mm. it's it's like proto art, right? Mm. It's like the first step in creating art, right. okay? Um, which is something only humans be, only human beings do, right? Okay, um, it's the first step in creating art, and um, I think what he's saying is that we are not just operating under our own power when we do that, right? When right, we yeah. when we go and create art. But we have yes, something yeah. from outside of us that's giving us, like, this monition, this movement that within us to do something, right? That this inspiration. inspiration. Right. right. Yeah. Um, and, and so Tolkien is trying to better understand what that is. And where it comes from. Yeah. Yeah. And what the purpose is. Exactly. Great powers they slowly brought out of themselves, and looking backward they beheld the elves that wrought on cunning forges in the mind, and light and dark on secret looms entwined. Um, what do you think he means by looking backward they beheld the elves? 
I don't know, actually. I, I am wondering, is he referencing the Valar? I don't think this? he I don't think that's what he's doing necessarily. I think elves um um have a have a have a meaning for Tolkien that precedes his own work. I see. Um, okay. That this notion of elves here. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to think. You know, it, I was thinking earlier today as I was reading this. I was like, you know, maybe we should have done on fairy stories first before we read this. But on fairy stories is just really long. I'm not sure we could have gotten through it in one podcast. Um, and I'm trying to. I didn't look up the line, but there's a point at which he talks about elves and on fairy stories. And kind mm-hmm. of like this elvish work, and um, uh, and I think for Tolkien, elves are. Oh yeah, he said. Okay, um, and on fairy stories, he says to the elvish craft enchantment fantasy aspires, and when it is successful, of all forms of human art, most nearly approaches. Uh, at the heart of many man-made stories of the elves lies, open or concealed, pure or alloyed. The desire for a living, realized, subcreative art, which is inwardly wholly different from the greed for self-centered power, which is the dark of the mere magician. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me, elves are um, elves are are this mysterious. They're, they're almost like um, fairies or just mysterious spirits, I guess, mm-hmm. for Tolkien. Okay. Um, I don't know that he really intended to like define that any more clearly, but just to say that elves are kind of these things that work on our minds, right? And give us these inspirations to make, all right, oh, okay. to make and to create. I see. So I, see. Okay. I think we can look, you know, there's so we have so many different ideas about what an elf an mm-hmm. elf is. Yeah. I think for Tolkien though, he's using it more in the sense of like a spirit or an inspiring force, right? Oh, okay, that makes sense. <clears throat> Yeah. yeah, I was just thinking of it as a more concrete, you know, I was just thinking of it in terms of what we've read in Silmarillion, but mm-hmm. what you described it as makes much more sense. Yeah. Now, I could be wrong. Maybe, maybe he does have intend there to be some kind of deeper connection. I think probably, though, the elves for him and his works were a were more of an embodiment of that mm-hmm. force, right? Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, All right. That's cool. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So Tolkien is basically saying to Lewis here, he's saying, "Look, why do we name things, right? And why do we make why do we make all this beautiful art in the first place?" Yeah. Right. Um, there's other factors going on here, right? Yeah. Uh, and so let's consider those a little more deeply. All right. First paragraph four. Um, he sees no stars who do not see them first of living silver made that sudden burst to flame like flowers beneath an ancient song, whose very echo after music long has since pursued. There is no firmament, only a void, unless a jeweled tent, myth woven and elf patterned, and no earth, unless the mother's womb whence all have birth. All right. There's another term in on fairy stories that I think he's, he's explaining here without using the term, um, and that term is recovery. Okay. Do you remember? Have we talked about that? I don't think so. Okay. <clears throat> but I did read about it on your. Ah, yes. On your. Uh, on the cheat sheet. Yes. Um, what do you remember about it? Um, what I remember about it is that it's um, basically it's how things <clears throat> are meant to be seen. Yes. And not necessarily how we see them. Right. But how they're intended. Right. To be seen. Yeah, I'm trying to find the. Um, here we go. Um, recovery is a regaining. Regaining of a clear view. <clears throat> I do not say seeing things as they are and involve myself with the philosophers, though I might venture to say seeing things as we are or were meant to see them, as things apart from ourselves. Um, so Tolkien is arguing here not in the, for this idea of, oh, Art is about seeing things as they truly are, right? Yeah. Uh, I think it'd be really easy to slip up and think that that's what Tolkien is advocating for. But he's very clear himself and on fairy stories that that's not what he's all about. He's about seeing things as they're really meant to be seen, mm-hmm. right? Yes. Um, 
about seeing things, not about seeing stars, not as Tolkien or as Lewis sees them, right? As uh, some matter in a ball compelled to course is mathematical, right? right? But what is what does Tolkien call them here? He calls them living silver. Yeah, living silver made that sudden burst to flame like flowers beneath an ancient song, right? Yeah. That's a whole lot different than some matter in a ball. Oh yeah, right, absolutely. Um, and Tolkien is arguing that us art is part of our completion of seeing, right? <clears throat> that, and, and and so we're starting to get this picture of why Tolkien was so into making, right? That art, it's he's almost like casting art as this sacred mission, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and that that really speaks to me, right? Like, mm-hmm. uh, and I think I think that probably speaks to a whole lot of people out there. Um, how many people out there feel like? I have something to create, right? And, and you know, maybe you put it off day after day and you're like, well, maybe one of these days I'll have enough time to actually sit down and do that, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, but it's like we never seem to find the time. And and we find other reasons to procrastinate for whatever reason. But And, and maybe we think that we don't we – sh- it's it's really – you know, there's other more important things. And, yeah, there, there are more important things. But I think sometimes – we think that making art is like way, 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 way down the list. Well, it's not practical. Exactly. Right? Not practical, right. It doesn't make money. Yeah. It doesn't exactly. And that, yeah, that's why so many like <laughs> colleges and universities are cutting like, yeah. you know, liberal arts programs, yeah. right? They're cutting, they're cutting programs that help people understand the world around them and right. put into words like English programs, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, you're going to go get an English degree, huh? Oh, well, the, what's the good of that, right? Mm-hmm. You know, how about getting an engineering degree, right? right. Yep. I mean, you know, Tolkien would say, actually, I think it's pretty darn important to get an English degree, right? Mm-hmm. Of course, he was an English professor, but... <laughs> sure, yeah. But you see why he'd say that right. now, yeah, right? No, absolutely, um, yeah. So he he ranks he ranks making he ranks creating art the creation of art the creation of literature the creation of music way further up in the list of priorities than most of us do mm-hmm. right yeah um, for him art is is a completion art is a way of completing ourselves as human beings yes. right yeah um, it's something we're almost called to yeah right you know if there's these this force outside of us that's inspiring us and giving us these movements then why aren't we responding to that. You know, to, mm. to take that up and to do something with it. Right. Right. Um, it's not saying that we should, so many people fight against it. You yeah. Know, but it's it's a very natural. Yes. It's a very natural uh, call, a very natural way to, you know, to express, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a reason for it. And mm-hmm. by repressing that. Um, but what but what's also there. interesting about that, that key of recovery, that notion of recovery is that. You know, so so often art for us can be this thing where it's like, oh, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna do what I want and make whatever I feel like making. You know, mm-hmm. and yeah, you don't want to constrain the artist to like you know tell them exactly what they need to make because that's not really the point. But at the same time, it is like we're being called to a certain destination to make something, right? Yeah. Leaf by Niggle, you know, Niggle makes something and it becomes real, right? Yes. And but it's like he was inspired to make that thing for a certain purpose, right. Right? right? It had an end. It wasn't just like, oh, I'm going to make this thing and it's going to be out there and people are right. going to look at it, right? Right, exactly. And, yes. and you know, he, he it's there was something acting from outside of him to bring him to that destiny, right? Mm-hmm. To bring him to that thing that he needed to make so that he and Parrish could be reconciled, right? Mm-hmm. Could have this place that they dwelled together and eventually be reconciled, wow. right? Yeah. And complete the love that they were supposed to share between between each other, right? Yeah. You know, which multiplies into this love for uh, Parrish's wife as well, right? Right. Yep. So that gives, I think, an even greater sense of the sacred mission. You know, I just think about Tolkien and the work that he did, the work that he pursued throughout his life, and what an incredible impact that's had on the world and on oh, so yeah. many different people. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I, you know me, you get me started, I get teary eyed about it. Right. Um, how much I love the Lord of the Rings and like how incredible that story is. Um, I had somebody comment on like, I was asking people why they love Tolkien so much on the blog recently. And 
um, you know, people were given just some great responses. And somebody said, um, I, I like Tolkien because it makes me nostalgic for heaven. Mm. And which I, I love. It's kind of a little, <clears throat> I had to think about it a little bit. But I think that's a good summation of like Tolkien puts into words so many of the struggles that we go through on a daily basis, but he doesn't make, he doesn't, he doesn't express it in this cheesy sort of canned way, you know, like, you know, like an allegory might do it, right. but he he does it in this way that makes it beautiful. Right. And it's like when you, when you feel like you're identifying with Frodo or somebody mm-hmm. else in the story, you're like, you're like, that's beautiful. You know, yeah. I mean, it, it's like hair on the back of your neck standing up beautiful, you know, and it gives you the will to persevere, right? Even in those difficult moments. Yes. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, I, I think you see, you're starting to see where, where Tolkien's going with this. Um, there is no firmament, only a void unless a jeweled tent, myth woven and elf patterned, and no earth. So firmament is the sky, the sky right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So he's saying, hey, it's only a void unless... Uh, unless you actually see the jeweled tent, myth woven and elf patterned, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. That we call it, right? Yes. No earth unless the mother's womb whence all have birth, right? Um, you know, either, either we just kind of come from the dust of the earth and we're just more dirt, right? Um, water and dirt put together in some weird arrangement or, um, or, or earth is giving us life, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. So the heart of man is not comp- compound of lies, but draws some wisdom from the only wise and still recalls him. Though now long estranged, man is not wholly lost nor wholly changed. Disgraced he may be, yet he is yet is not dethroned and keeps the rags of lordship once he owned his world dominion by creative act, not his to worship the great artifact. Man, sub-creator, the, refla- the refracted light, through whom is splintered from a single white to many hues, and endlessly combined in living shapes that move from mind to mind. Though all the crannies of the world we filled with elves and goblins, though we dared to build gods and their houses out of dark and light, and sow the, seeds, the seed of dragons, t'was our right, used or misused. The right has not decayed. We make still by the law in which we're made. All right. So that's that may be my favorite paragraph, first paragraph of the whole thing. Uh, the heart of man is not compound of lies, but draws some wisdom from the only wise and still recalls him. All right. So he gets a little clearer here and talks about um, the wisdom coming from the only wise, from God, right? Yeah. Um, that these things that we're so accustomed to, th- like that Lewis would have called lies, these myths, we're drawing on a greater a greater logic, a greater reason, right? Um, what is, what does the gospel of John call, call Christ <clears throat> in, the, in the beginning? The word. The word, right? Yeah. And what is that in Greek? Logos. Logos, right? Logos. And when you think of logos in Greek, that is more like the reason, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, that's, that's the why. Like, you want to ask why? <laughs> We all we want to know why we want to know why things happen, all right? Yeah. Well, for Tolkien as a Christian, the answer is you keep asking why, why, why. The answer is you get to that point where you can't ask why anymore. You think there's no more point in asking why. Well, for the Christian, that's the the why. That final why is Christ, right? He is the why. Okay, mm-hmm. not something that you can just understand and you're good, but a person. Right. Right. A person that is the fulfillment of all. Okay. Um, the beginning and the end. Um, so we draw on that, right? We draw on that person, on that wisdom, that that is that reason that's that is the foundation of everything. Okay. Right. When we go to make, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, because um, I mean, it. I think that paragraph makes very clear too that. That um, that man is made in God's image, mm-hmm. right? And so, um, ultimately, we are going to be, you know, that that's going that's our end purpose, right? Is right. to is to um, 
to glorify him in what we do, right? And 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 he helps us along figuring out what that looks like, right? Yeah. What is it that we should be doing <clears throat> to glorify him? But um, but yeah, that definitely um, that makes sense. I love those two lines: disgraced he may be, yet he yet is not dethroned. Yeah, and keeps the rags of lordship once he owned. <clears throat> His world dominion by creative act. Um, so that, I mean, that in of itself, just right there, he comes around and says by creative act. Mm-hmm. You know, that that's what enables us to keep us still on that throne with our, you know, with our rags of lordship, mm-hmm. right? Is that creativity. Right. That keeps us where we're supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he kind of works in the fall here, right? <laughs> Disgraced he may be, yet is right. not dethroned. Right. Though now long estranged, man is not wholly lost nor wholly changed. Right. Right. So it's like we've fallen, but we're not completely um, lost, you know? Right. We're not completely, like, just utterly um, without hope. No, because, again, we're made in God's image. Right. And um, because of Christ, yeah. right, we've, um, we've been reconciled. Um, well, in, the, in, in, in this, too, if I can wax a little bit theological on, on like, Catholic theology here, um, you know, the, the, the Catholic understanding of grace— with respect to like with with original sin and the fall, right? Mm-hmm. Is that human beings by nature, we're we're just by nature we're we're, um, maybe I'm getting a little, little a little over my head here, but but basically grace is like an add on for us, right? Grace is like something that perfects us, right? Mm-hmm. Grace is this supernatural added on thing. It's not part of our nature, in other words, right? Right. It's this added on thing that is soup that is that is this abundance for us right that god gives us in order to share in his life Mm -hmm. right it's not natural for us to share in the life of god right he gives us grace in order that we might be able to right yeah um so being disgraced we lose out on that right Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um that's the fall right Right. but still we're not dethroned right still we we retain that that position wherein we name the animals right Right. yes you know wherein we we create art Mm -hmm. um and um let's see and so when you get down um where does he say it uh the right has not decayed we make still by the law in which we're made okay Mm -hmm. um the sub creator thing we have a share in in the original creator's Abilities, right? In that yes. regard. Yep. Um, so to make things beautiful and to work on the things of the world. All right. So um, jumping ahead to um, the next first paragraph. Um, yes. Wish fulfillment dreams we spend to cheat. Our timid hearts and ugly fact defeat. Whence came the wish and whence the power to dream? Or some things fair and others ugly deem? All wishes are not idle, nor in vain fulfillment we devise. For pain is pain, nor for itse- not for itself to be desired, but ill. Or else to strive, or to subdue the will, alike were graceless. And of evil this alone is, is dreadly certain. Evil is. Wish fulfillment dreams. What do you, what do you make of that? Um, I didn't actually understand this at all. Which is why I was happy to have your <laughs> your breakdown <laughs> at my fingertips while I was reading this. Um, and I don't quite um, wish fulfillment dreams. So what's interesting about that is it's in quotes. Yeah. Right? So he's obviously using somebody else's words. Right? Um, those are not his own words. Yes. But I can't remember whose words he's using. Well, I don't think it's necessarily that. That may be those may be words that Lewis said somewhere. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know. That's clear, but but he could just be somebody. He's like you know he could just be referring to something he hears a lot, right? Oh, okay. Because again, Tolkien, being an academic uh, at Oxford at this time, was probably not surrounded by a lot of people who thought like him in this regard. Right. Right. Yeah. He was probably surrounded by a lot of people who um, were maybe atheists, right? Mm-hmm. Who um, who did think like, you know, and that's, and that's something you hear a lot from atheists, right? Or, or, uh, people who think religion is kind of stupid, right? Yeah. Um, is that religion is this, 
it's just wish fulfillment, you know? It's a, it's a grown-up person Santa Claus, right? We want to believe yeah. that the universe yeah. is not cold and indifferent to us. And so uh, we, and we want to believe that death is not the end. So we create, um, we create these little dreams, these little wish fulfillment dreams to help us along, to help us get it through the day, get through the day. Interesting. Right? Okay. Now okay. for religious, you know, for a, for a religious person, they're going to, they're going to say, well, no, that's not what I believe at all. Right. You know, you might claim that what I believe is not true, but you know, I happen to have, believe I have very good reasons for believing this right. to be true. Yeah. Right. Not to just get through the day. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, but Tolkien kind of takes a different spin on that notion, and he says, "Hey, yeah, I am, I am, I do have some wish fulfillment dreams. We spent because I'm because I I don't want to ex- just accept that ugly fact, right? That that the universe is just this cold and lonely place, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. I refuse to accept that, right? He's being a little standoffish here, okay? Because when I accept that, then I get all huddled up inside myself, and I'm afraid." And I don't go and venture out and try and and overcome, right? Okay. Right? That's that yeah. whole timid heart concept. Mm. Um, and so there's a key kind of idea that you can find in some, in like Tolkien's work on um, like Beowulf and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Where he, and you see this throughout his, throughout Lord of the Rings too. You have these righteous pagans, right? These people who come before Christ, all right? And they, it's like they're fighting against the darkness that seems to be coming, you know, all they know is that death is going to happen and, and death seems to be the end, Mm -hmm. right? And so all they're trying to do is kind of hold out for this little swath of some kind of civilization in this life, right? And, but everything at the end, death just seems to win. Death always seems to win. Death always seems to win, right? That ugly fact. Um, And so for Tolkien... The myths that came before Christ were these wish fulfillment dreams, right? They were a way for men to take heart, right? Mm. And to encourage themselves to fight back against the darkness, right? Mm. Okay? Um, So, in this way, they were a good thing, right? They weren't just um, these things that people made up just because they were looking for something to make up. They were... were these stories that gave people the ability, you know, to stand up to the darkness, right? right? It was a means of survival. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And not just like, not just like physical survival, right. but survival was, of the spirit yeah, too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know? Spiritual, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, whence came the wish and whence the power to dream or some things fair and others ugly deem, right? Why did these people have this ability, right? Again, animals don't do that. Animals are kind of faced with the same thing. But they just go on make they just go on eating their food and drinking and sleeping and Mm -hmm. carrying out their nature, right? They don't have this thing within them that causes them to look beyond, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, So, and and it's kind of the stark moment where he says, "Pain is pain, and one thing is dreadfully certain: evil is." Right. Mm -hmm. You know that's something we can all really see, right? Yeah. We all know. You know, unless you're sheltered, unless you just never read about it, you know that, man, there's some evil stuff going on in this world. Mm-hmm. And, and and you can just talk about natural sort of evil, like, you know, people dying of some kind of illness that, you know, is not caused by another person. Or you can think about just the stuff that people do, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, one of my favorite examples of, of the incredible ability of people to be evil is... Um, I think it's Iago from Othello. Have you read Othello? No, I haven't. Iago is like this... He's The whole play is about him trying to get back at Othello, right? Iago is this guy who like buddies up to Othello, but the whole reason he's doing it is because he wants to get revenge on Othello, right? Okay. And it's incredible, like the lengths he goes to just to torment Othello, right? Huh. And you read this and you're like, this is not just something an animal does, you know? And, I, and I'm kind of harping on that point about animals not doing this kind of stuff. Again, we have within us as human beings this capacity that is is inexplicable as anything other than something kind of special about us, right? Right. Yeah. 
Um, and evil is one of the primary indicators of that, right? Absolutely. Our ability to do evil. Yes. You know, you think about the great civil, some of the great civilizations in the last hundred years that have done evil, the quote unquote great civilizations, right? Um, I mean, the Nazis are the one that, that always spring first and foremost to mind. So civilized. You, you remember we were, I was watching this thing about the Nazis and their like love for art. Like, you know, like they stole all these pieces of art and, yes, yeah. and they were like, they had such high taste in art and everything. And then they, they go and they murder six million Jews, yeah. you know? Yeah. And it's just like, how does that happen? Yeah, it's a you disconnect know? for sure. Yeah. It's yeah. really, it's really bizarre. Yeah. Um, and so Tolkien just kind of pauses on that moment and says, evil is, right? Mm-hmm. This is certain. Evil yeah. is. Right? Yeah. And we do need a way to cope with it. I mean, we do. We need a way to be able to process it. And I think Tolkien's saying that, again, creativity, mm-hmm. right, is one of the ways that we can, that we can, you know, um, you know, maybe not make sense of it necessarily, but at least process it and deal with it. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and also overcome it. I mean, yeah. Um, I think creativity is a is a key means to overcoming, um, to overcoming evil. You know, the the kind of our response to evil on a natural level is always to want to avenge it, right? To get yeah. back at it. Yeah. And um, but obviously the the Christian way kind of goes beyond beyond that right it, mm-hmm. it creates something more beautiful right out of it you know the, the the primary example obviously is the cross right yeah um which takes this evil act this great evil act and flips it on its head and makes it the source of life and of beauty yep. right yeah um and that's i mean you know again it's it's mind-boggling how that happens we can just think about we can just think about the story of I mean, you just think about the Lord of the Rings and all of the evil that Frodo has to endure, mm-hmm. you know, doing his mission and even even failing at the very end of it, right? Mm-hmm. If it weren't for, you know, failing of his own will, but fortunately providence comes, comes through, yeah. but failing of his own will, yet how beautiful is it, you know? I mean, how beautiful is it truly, like, when he, that he does all of that, right? Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and Tolkien, that's kind of what he's referring to with these people making myths before. You know, they were trying to find expression for this thing they sensed within themselves, right? That this can't be all there is, mm-hmm. right? I, I don't, you know, they didn't know how to explain it. They didn't know how to explain the world around them because mm-hmm. they were in darkness. Right. But yeah. they said, this cannot be, this cannot be all there is. There must be more. Right? Yeah. I know because of beauty, right? Because mm-hmm. of the beauty that's in the world, yes. even if it's faint. Yep. Right? Yep. Definitely. I mean, beauty is its own apologetic for, for good. Yeah. You know? If if something can be this beautiful, then there must be somebody out there who loves me, right? Mm. And is reaching out to me. Yeah. Right? Yep. Um, so, I, you know, I, I think that's an important little pivotal moment there. Um all right, then we get the Beatitudes, the Maker Beatitudes. All right. Blessed are the timid hearts that evil hate, that quail in its shadow, and yet shut the gate, that seek no parley, and in guarded room, through small and, though small and bare, upon a clumsy loom, weave tissues gilded by the far-off day, hoped and believed in under shadow's sway. Um, so these kind of build on each other, right? You got the timid yes. hearts that evil hate, you got the men of mm-hmm. Noah's race that build their little arks, and, you, and you've got the legend makers, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so the, you know, the timid hearts are kind of like the weak, but there's, but Tolkien still salutes them, right? He says, he says, at least they're trying, they're, they, they're working upon their small clumsy looms, these weaving these little tissues, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because they hope and believe for something more, right? right. And All there's right. a steadfastness there. There is. They shut the gate, right? Yeah. They may not be able to do much more. They may not be able to come storming out of the gates and, and, and storm, the gates of hell, right? But they can shut the gate on evil at least, right? Right? They don't give in to temptation, right? Yeah, right. They're strong. Um, you know, I may not have all the answers, but I know this is wrong, and I refuse to take part in it, right? right? Yeah. Um. Uh, Blessed are the men of Noah's race that build their little arks, though mm-hmm. frail and poorly filled, and steer through winds contrary toward a wraith, a rumor of a harbor guessed by faith, right? 
So these are these are people who come out of the gate and they see something in the distance that they feel like they need to get to, and so they build this little ark trying to get there, right? Mm-hmm. Even though it's not a great vessel, um, and and it's just this rumor that they've guessed, right? Right. That they seem to see off in the distance a wraith. It's this ghostly sort of thing, mm-hmm. right? But still, they steer towards it, right? Yes, and that that also, you know, they so they these people have gone one step further, mm-hmm. right, than the other ones because they've they've noticed the problem and instead of hiding and cowering Mm -hmm. they are trying to escape right exactly yeah exactly and then finally you have the legend makers with their rhyme of things not found within recorded time it is not they that have forgot the night or bid us flee to organize delight in lotus isles of economic bliss for swearing souls to gain a circe kiss and counterfeit at that machine produced bogus seduction of the twice seduced um so, you know, I think we've talked about this before, but one of the things that Tolkien, um, I think, must have gotten accused of a lot was was being an escapist, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and a lot of times people who are very realist will accuse um, people who write fantasy and that sort of thing of being escapist. You just don't want to deal with reality. Yeah. Um, and Tolkien's response to that would have been, well, you're right. I don't like dealing with the reality, especially as the reality the reality that we get day by day that is evil and ugly, right? right? And like that reality that's forced upon us, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. I prefer to think that there's a greater reality to which I I hope for. And yeah. that's what I would prefer to write about and to allude to in my works, right? Yeah. Um, so Tolkien was a fan of what he called escape, right? Yes. And um, and so he kind of he kind of flips it on their on its head this notion of escapism, and he says, you know. I, I, I'm not just going to accept the night. I'm not going to accept that what's real in the here and now is what's finally real, yeah. right? Um, Tolkien's, Tolkien's idea of the real goes beyond the real here and now into the real. It, it's like an eschatological real, right? It's a real, it's a, it's a real in terms of fulfillment, right? Fulfillment of all things. Um, you know, lotus isles. Do you remember what the lotus, what that refers to? What a lotus the the lotus from Greek mythology. Yeah, it's um. I know Circe is the the seducer from the Odyssey. Right. I don't remember the lotus. Either. Well, the lotus too is. Um, I think I think um, Odysseus um, men like ate the ate the lotus and fell asleep. Hmm, Am I thinking maybe. of that right? Probably. I got to read up. You read, you read the Odyssey. I did. Recently, I read right? it. I read it last year. <laughs> Well, you got that. Um, we got our illustrated copy of it over there. Um, I didn't think they ate lotuses, though. I would remember that. I know that they they were they're the sirens, right? Mm-hmm. Would lure them, would lure them in, and Cersei. Maybe Cersei did feed them lotuses, but uh, yeah. But you uh, can see that idea, right? It's kind of like people are too taking often taking the easy way out. Yeah, taking the easy way out. Exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah. oh, just entertain us. You know, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. that's fine. Put us um, in our happy place. Put us in our happy Let's place. Forget about real life. Yeah, give me give me my fix. Um, right. Medicate me. Let me be in my happy place. Um, and Tolkien saying, no, 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 no. Um, the 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 truly blessed reach for that thing beyond that, right? That that go for something that are dis that are not content with you putting them in their happy place, right? right? right. Because they believe in something greater. Right, right? exactly. Um, exactly. They know that that's just a band-aid, right? That's, that's, a te- that's just a temporary thing. Yeah. That's not going to last. Such isles they saw afar, and ones more fair, and those that hear them yet may yet beware. They have seen death and ultimate defeat, and yet they would not in despair retreat. But off to victory have turned the lyre and kindled hearts with legendary fire. Illuminating now in dark hath been with light of suns as yet by no man seen. Right. So mm-hmm. he's still talking there about the legend makers. Legend makers, right? The ultimate warriors. Right. And right. he's saying, he's saying that these are the ones that kindle hearts to something greater. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I just think of like, I think of um, the end near the end of the Lord of the Rings when, um, you know, like the ride of the Rohirrim. Right, um, when the, the the riders of Rohan are like coming upon that huge field where um, that you know of, of orcs and the armies of Mordor mm-hmm. that are attacking oh, yeah. Yeah. Gondor, they're attacking Minas Tirith, mm-hmm. and 
and it's like you know this is probably going to turn out badly for them but they they just they refuse they first of all they've got to fulfill their their oath mm-hmm. to to Minas Tirith to help and second of all it's like we have to ride you know we're we're going to we're going to ride for something good even if it means our death right we're going to um, yeah we might we're going to we might die but we're going to die doing the right thing exactly right? Gonna, exactly yeah and um and then even at at the very end when um uh when they march over to the gates of mordor and um and they don't even know if frodo has succeeded Mm-hmm. And for all they know, he hasn't. But they they do their best to basically become a distraction and sacrifice themselves for, um, you know, in order to maybe provide Frodo his last chance, yeah. right? And it turns out yeah. to be the thing that draws the eye of Sauron away yes. from Mount Doom at the right at the exactly There's the right time. moment, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so and they didn't know that, right? They didn't yeah. know that was that was the case, yeah. mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. They just knew that they had to bring the war, right? They had to continue the battle against against evil right. right yeah yeah I love that that line they have they have seen death and ultimate defeat and yet they would not in despair retreat that's right I mean that's like you know I mean that's like the ultimate um you know courage I think right there like you know right mm-hmm. you know it's waiting and you know you've, you've looked it in the face right you stared it down and you know how dark and scary it can be and yet you stick with it. Yeah. You know, you continue on. Yeah. It makes me the, the line that uh, Theoden says to the writers of Rohan. I think I think it is. Maybe I'm not. I, I think this is from the book. I might be confusing it with the movie. Um, but he says, ride to ruin and the world's ending. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, which is, you know, he's like, he yells at, you know, as, as they're getting ready to, to just plunge into this sea of orcs and mm-hmm. trolls and everything else. And, you know, he basically says to them, you know, ride, you know, he yells to them, ride to ruin and the world's ending, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and that's the idea here. It also kind of brings up the notion that you really have nothing to lose, you mm-hmm. know? Because it's like, you know, damn if you do, damn, you know, darn if you do, darn if you don't. Nothing to right? lose except your soul, right? Well, right, yeah. Well, <laughs> and that's, yes. that's the thing, right? Right. Because any, they could have said, well, look, we could just make peace with... Mordor, and we could just be slaves, yeah, that's true. you know. Yeah, and that's kind of the that's what Tolkien's calling out, right? Yeah, we do have something to lose, and it's our souls, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, Tolkien is calling that out clearly, and he's saying the people. He's saying there are people who are just like, "Yep, give me my Lotus Isles of economic bliss," mm-hmm. right? And he's saying, "No, we're called to something greater," yeah. right? Yeah, um, better to do. Better to lose your life than to lose your soul, right? Right. Um, better yeah. to lose your life than to lose your soul. Yes. Yeah. All right. So, um, I would that I might with the minstrels sing and stir the unseen with a throbbing string. I would be with the mariners of the deep that cut their slender planks on mountain steep and voyage upon a vague and wandering quest, for some have passed beyond the fabled west. I would with the beleaguered fools be told that keep an inner fastness where their gold, impure and scanty, yet they loyally bring to mint an image blurred of distant king. Or in fantastic banners weave the sheen, heraldic emblems of a lord unseen. Um, so Tolkien's saying, I would rather sing with the minstrels, right? I would rather sing of these things. Um, uh, I would I would rather be with those who take take to the voyage of the sea, Right, mm. um, and pass beyond the fabled west. Um, you know, send me out on the quest right. for something greater. Right, yep. that's that's what he's saying. That's what he's, he's saying. saying don't there. give me the easy way out. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Make me work for it. Yeah. I will not walk with your progressive apes, erect and sapient. Before them gapes the dark abyss to which their progress tends. If by God's mercy progress ever in, ever ends. I love that line. If by God's mercy progress ever ends. And does not ceaselessly revolve the same unfruitful course with unchanging of a name. I mean, every day people are just saying, uh, you know, oh, we're just making progress. We're continu- you know, we're making progress. You know, twenty years from now, I just saw something today like about how we'll have all diseases wiped out in twenty years. Uh, you know, somebody was claiming that, mm-hmm. and I was like, I bet there was somebody claiming that twenty years ago, <laughs> and I bet there was somebody claiming that twenty years before course, that. Yeah, right. Yeah, and. Hey, 
I don't know, maybe one of these days we'll we'll wipe out a lot of diseases, yeah. right? Uh, but that's still not going to prob- solve the problem of death, right? Yeah. Mm-mm. And I'm willing to bet that even if we think we've solved a bunch of diseases, we're just going to make things worse in another area, right? Absolutely. You know? Yeah. And um, and I think that's I think that's what he's hinting at here is this idea of progress, right? Um, progress, like apart from apart from God, progress apart from grace is is not really progress. It's just more of like it's an entrenchment in our self deception, mm-hmm. right? Um. Yeah. So, you know, I think that's what I think that's what he's calling out here, right? Um, I will not tread your dusty path and flat, denoting this and that by this and that. Your world and new, immutable, wherein no part the little maker has with maker's art. I bow not yet before the iron crown, nor cast my own small golden scepter down. Yeah, it's a very. It has a, this paragraph has a very um, defiant yes tone to it. Yeah, you know, he's like, okay, I've made my case. Yeah, right? I think it's a pretty good one right and because of that i refuse i refuse to see the world the way that you see it lewis right Right? like i just refuse yeah i mean it's it's almost it's almost a sense and you know lewis would go on i mean i think lewis was very inspired by all of this and he would go on this would be a lot of what he would talk about in his own future writings especially like his philosophical writings on um on christianity and that and that kind of thing yeah um even just this um this sense of desire right he was the one that said you know, we're far too often like the little kids who get invited to a day at the beach and we say we'd much rather just thank you, we'd much rather just spend time in the sandbox making making mud pies, you know, um, when we could go to the beach, you know. Yeah. And, you know, he's saying we want, it's not that we don't want, it's not what we want too much, it's that we want far too little, yeah. right? That's our problem. That's the root problem with us is that we think, you know, if I could just have my happy, you know, Mm -hmm. 80 or so years on this earth and, you know, have some fun. Yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty good life. I'll handle that. Mm -hmm. And and Tolkien is saying, no, that's not, that's not what we are. That's a lie. Like that. Yeah. We, we, we are called to something so much greater than that. Yeah. Um, and, and it's hard for us to see that because of the evil in the world and because we know we die yeah. and because death is still seems like this dark thing for us. But again, at the heart of all this is Christ um, and, and the, and how Christ has turned the tables on that. Right. It's yes. still, it's still in the Easter octave while we record this and, you know, the resurrection is the thing that, that changes the perspective on death, right? Yep. The res- if the resurrection really happened, right, then what do we have to fear from death anymore, right? Yeah. I mean, that's that's kind of... The people that Tolkien was writing about here were people before the resurrection, right? So they, they still had something to fear, yet even they knew something within them told them, wh- whether it was the art they were called to create or whatever, told them that this can't be the end, Yeah. right? Yep. Um, so yeah, very defiant, and um, and, and he's basically saying, you know what? I'm not going to bow, and I will I will go on making, even if it's even I'm, even if I'm just a little maker. Because I'd rather be a little maker than no maker, right? right? Mm-hmm. Um, than one of your erect and sapient uh, progressive apes, right? right. Um. You know, and that's an important note too, because he's kind of playing. He's he kind of riffing off the idea of like, oh, we're just, you know, we're just more evolved apes, right? You know, yeah, um, yeah. And and instead, he's saying like, we are, we're different. We 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 are unique, right? Yeah. We're not just a we're not just a more progressed animal. We are unique beings. We are we are, per, you know, more progressed animals, but we're. But we're more than that, yeah. you know? Yeah. All right. In paradise, perchance, the eye may stray from gazing upon everlasting day to see the day illumined and renew from mirrored truth the likeness of the true. Then looking on the blessed land, twill see that all is as it is and yet made free. Salvation changes not, nor yet destroys. Garden not, nor gardener, children nor their toys. Evil it will not see, for evil lies not in God's picture, but in crooked eyes. Not in the source, but in malicious choice. 
and not in sound, but in the tuneless voice. In paradise they look no more awry, and though they make anew, they make no lie. Be sure they still will make, not being dead, and poets shall have flames upon their head, and harps whereon their faultless fingers fall. There each shall choose forever from the all. So this is kind of an epilogue, but I think what Tolkien is saying is that they just because we'll be in heaven, just because, you know, we'll be in paradise, he doesn't think that's an end to our making, right? Right. Um, uh, like just the opposite, it's just going to enhance right. our making. Exactly. Right? It's going to yeah. glorify it. Um, yeah, all things are perfected, right? Yes. By grace. Salvation changes not, nor yet destroys. Garden nor garden, nor children nor their toys. Um, uh, and evil is, even though evil is, um, evil is also kind of a phantom, right? It's not in God's picture, but in crooked eyes. It's in our own way of seeing sometimes, mm-hmm. right? Not in the source, but in malicious choice. Hmm. Um, not in sound, but in the tuneless voice, the voice that refuses to sing, right? Um, hmm. The voice that refuses to look at something bad that happens to them and try to understand, even though it's hard, it's not easy, but, but when something bad happens to you, how it may in fact be providential, Right? How it could be used for something greater, right? Right, mm-hmm. because yeah. that's the voice that sings. Yeah, the voice, the person that sees that is the person who can sing. Um. So. Um, and there each shall choose forever from the all. Great last line. All right, what do you think? Good you under- stuff. You understand better? Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's um, it's 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 definitely very uh, philosophical and mm-hmm. very um, you know, it definitely takes some unpacking, for sure. But um, I think his message is amazing, and um, it makes me want to be creative, even though <laughs> I'm not really. <laughs> it doesn't come easy. I'm well, not. Well, no, I I think everybody has their own creative. We talked it, about this yeah, before. Yeah, they do. I guess. I guess for some people, it just comes easier. For others, well, um, but there's. There's different there's different types of creativity, right? Yes. Um, yeah, that's true. I think I think the call is for everyone to like do something, do that thing to which you're called, but also to view everything you do as as a creative act, as something unique in and of itself, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, one of the one of the consequences of the view of the universe that Tolkien rails against is that everything becomes commodified you're just doing your thing right you're right. you're just you're just doing the work that you need to do as your is is your little because you're a little cog in the machine right yeah. um you're producing what you need to produce good producer stroke 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 yeah. right right and um and Tolkien is saying no each of us has something to do mm-hmm. right each of us has something beautiful to make right yeah. maybe that's beautiful food right maybe that's Maybe that's the beauty we pour into raising our kids, right? Maybe, mm-hmm. maybe that's the, the hope of forming them into beautiful human beings, right? Mm-hmm. Beautiful in terms of soul, right? Right. Um, that's, that comes from the care and the affection you put into those things, right? Mm-hmm. So. Yes. And that last line, the, they're, they're each shall choose forever from the all. Mm-hmm. Um, magic that to me is as um like finally our our true inspiration will be realized in God. Yeah. Right? Like once once we ourselves are glorified, right? Um and all of our creative works have been perfected. Right. Right? That that that's that's where it's at. Yeah. And that's really what this journey here on earth is that's that's what we're heading toward. Mm-hmm. Right? That's the end goal. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 So it's not like it's really a journey's end, but it's a it's a perfection of journey. You know, it's a perfection of um of our abilities. Mm-hmm. You know, to we arrive at a perfection of our abilities, and and so that we can use those to the to their fullest, right? Yeah. In ways we you know we probably can't imagine. So. Yeah, that's awesome. All right. Well, this has gone on far long enough. All right. <laughs> All good, though. All good stuff. 
All right. Well, any any last thoughts? No, I don't. I don't think so. Um, I really enjoyed this though. Yeah, it's yeah. good. It's good stuff. Yes. All right. Next time we're gonna pick back up with uh, I think chapter seven of the Silmarillion. Okay. So um, you know, Melkor just got let out of jail. So you know, something bad's about to happen. You know it. Yeah. Things are gonna get crazy. Crazy. Yep. Uh, oh no, they did. <laughs> All right. All right. So stop. yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening. Bye, y'all. Bye, bye. Please remember to check out TrueMyths.org for show notes as well as other Tolkien goodness. Also, we hope you're enjoying this podcast as much as we are enjoying making it. Please leave us a rating and feedback on iTunes. On the next podcast, we will continue our discussion of the Silmarillion with Chapter Seven. Please tune in and thanks for listening. <laughs>